on World News Tonight. Devastating attacks. Ukraine's capital Kyiv faces Russia's wrath in the form of kamikaze drones. Controversial Congress. China's Communist Party prepares for a historic re-election at the 20th Congress. Catastrophic floods. Australia struggles to stay afloat with multiple states having serious threats from torrential downpours. And Bollywood beauty. Mumbai Fashion Week sees dazzling displays of Indian wear mixed with Western flair. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Russia attacked the center of Kyiv during morning rush hour with drones, sending residents fleeing for shelter. Explosions were heard and soldiers fired into the air trying to shoot down drones. The Russia attack caused several fires and damaged residential blocks. Ukrainian soldiers and emergency workers were on the Kyiv streets following the attack. At least one death has been confirmed following the drone strikes exactly a week after Russian missiles slammed into Kyiv during the morning Russia in the heaviest attack on the Ukrainian capital since the early days of Russia's invasion. Syrians heard several blasts and saw smoke and flames rising above buildings. Kyiv's mayor also said residential buildings had been damaged and that one person was still trapped under the rubble. Forces later saw pieces of a drone used in the attack that bore the words for Belgorod, an apparent reference to Ukrainian shelling of a Russian region bordering Ukraine. Emergency workers, fire trucks, ambulances and other emergency vehicles attended to the damage. Chinese President Xi Jinping hailed his Communist Party's zero-COVID policies and graph crackdown as he opened a five-yearly Congress at which thousands of delegates were set to rubber stamp his bid to rule for a historic third term. With the sound of trumpets and rapturous applause, Chinese President Xi Jinping is welcomed into the Great Hall of the People at Beijing's Tiananmen Square, taking to the stage to deliver a lengthy report outlining policy priorities. Xi said the Congress came at a critical moment. The whole party and the people of all ethnic groups are embarking on a new journey of comprehensively building a modernized socialist country. At the end of the week-long meeting, the thousands of delegates in attendance are expected to extend Xi's rule as Communist Party chief. It would make him the first to serve a third term since founder of Communist China Mao Zedong. Xi congratulated the party on action from its harsh zero-COVID rule to Hong Kong's, quote, transition from chaos to governance. However, the 69-year-old said Taiwan was a matter to be resolved. We will adhere to striving for the prospect of a peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and greatest efforts, but will never commit to abandoning the use of force. During his decade in power, Xi has set China on an increasingly authoritarian path, tightening controls on information and dissent. But he's also expanded the country's global influence through the Belt and Road Initiative. Over the next five years, analysts expect little change in Beijing's policies. Thousands were warned to flee their homes in southeastern Australia to escape surging floodwaters, threatening towns across three separate states. The flooding emergency was the worst in Victoria, where rapidly rising waters swamped suburbs of Melbourne, forcing evacuation. State leader Daniel Andrews said the Victorian government was preparing to reopen a COVID-19 quarantine centre to shelter those whose homes were uninhabitable. Near-record flood levels were expected in the towns of Shepparton and Murkison, north of Melbourne. Northern parts of Tasmania, an island state of south of Victoria, were also preparing for major floods. Mass evacuation orders were issued, while heavy rains forced the closure of some 120 roads. Tasmania's state emergency service said in a statement that lives are at risk from floodwaters. In New South Wales, Australia's most populous state, an evacuation centre was set up after intense downpours in Forbes. Britain's new finance minister Jeremy Hunt has insisted Prime Minister Liz Truss was staying put, but after one of the most turbulent weeks in British political history. But with Truss facing a mutiny inside the governing Conservative Party, her leadership is hanging by a thread. I had 
Liz Truss was nowhere to be seen on UK television on Sunday. Instead, she was holding crisis talks with her new chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, after one of the most turbulent weeks in UK political history. And it was left to Hunt to pick up the pieces, insisting that the Prime Minister would stay put. Actions speak louder than words. Uh, the Prime Minister has changed her chancellor. More political instability at the top, another protracted leadership campaign. I think that's the last thing that people really want to happen. But inside the Conservative Party, talk abounds about how to get Liz Truss out of Downing Street. Crispin Blunt has become the first party MP openly calling for her to go. And reports suggest groups of MPs are already plotting to remove the Prime Minister, with one newspaper saying that could happen within the next week. Critics say the party could be obliterated in a general election if Truss remains in charge. So there's been one horror story after another. It's not just about tax cuts for the rich, but about benefit cuts, cuts to public services. Uh, even today we're reading that they may uh, impose charges on long-term sick and disabled for, who are parking at hospitals. And this is not what the, what the public wants. Writing in a Sunday newspaper, Truss said she'd listened and gotten the message. She said we cannot pave the way to a low-tax, high-growth economy without maintaining the confidence of the markets. But it may already be too late for Truss to get that confidence back. It's now the week ahead that could make or break the UK's new Prime Minister. North Korea fired around 400 artillery rounds off its east and west coast, violating the 2018 military agreement. Pyongyang's move came despite warnings from Seoul urging the regime to halt such provocations. At about 5 p.m. on Friday, North Korea fired approximately 90 artillery rounds toward waters off its east coast. About 20 minutes later, it fired about 300 artillery rounds toward the West Sea. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the shells landed in eastern and western maritime buffer zones, north of the northern Lemon Line, but said none of them landed in South Korean waters. The buffer zones are boundaries set to ease military tensions along the border area. The South Korean military said this was a clear violation of the Inter-Korean Military Tension Reduction Agreement and strongly urged the regime to immediately stop its provocative actions. It also said it's closely monitoring the situation with the U.S. and is maintaining strong defense readiness in case of an emergency situation. In response, U.S. State Department deputy spokesperson urged on North Korea to cease all provocations and called the regime to return to talks. We continue to believe uh, our ultimate goal is the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and we uh, continue to remain open to diplomacy and dialogue uh, as a step towards getting there. The latest move from the North came despite South Korea's warning on Friday. Our military is sending a clear warning to North Korea for violating the military agreement and escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, and we strongly urge the regime to immediately put a halt to these actions. South Korea sent the warning after North Korea carried out multiple provocations starting late Thursday night. The North fired a total of 170 artillery rounds in the early hours of Friday, which also landed in maritime buffer zones. At about 2 a.m. on Friday, the regime also fired a short-range ballistic missile toward waters off its east coast. And for two hours from 10.30 p.m. on Thursday, around 10 or so North Korean warplanes were spotted flying close to the inter-Korean border, crossing the tactical action line, something that's not happened for the past five years. Seoul's JCS said it would hold an annual defense drill for 12 days starting next Monday. That will involve field training to strengthen its operational capabilities under various scenarios for North Korean threats. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. French refiner and fuel depot workers at five sites owned by oil giant Total Energies have extended their strike, union leaders said, compounding concern over petrol supply ahead of wider protests early next week. For some of the strikers, the union has vowed to fight on, like here in Donge in western France. Total Energy's five refineries are at a standstill because no agreement has been reached between the CGT and the company. But the union has promised fuel will be available this weekend. Since the government requisitions, fuel trucks are again leaving the Dunkirk depot. And some service stations in the city are open for business. But nationally, around 28% of stations are still out of at least one type of fuel, 
and some regions have seen more shortages than others, like here in the Paris area, where the lines keep getting longer. The government says it believes things will be back to normal by next week. But experts say two to three weeks is more likely because it will take some time to restart the refineries. With the latest televised Senate debate in the U.S., races tighten across the country. Barely three weeks out from Election Day in Georgia, early voting begins tomorrow, and Republicans hope to win back the majority. Members and supporters of the Cobb County Republican Party in Georgia gathered at their headquarters in Marietta late on Friday to watch Democratic U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker trade blows in a contentious televised debate. The showdown is a key contest that could help determine control of the Senate in the November 8th congressional elections. The two sparred over a range of issues from abortion to policing to personal integrity. Walker, a one-time football star and political novice backed by former U.S. President Donald Trump, sought to brand the incumbent as a rubber stamp for Democratic President Joe Biden's agenda, which Republicans have painted as responsible for inflation, crime and other social ills. Because I said President Trump is my friend. Warnock, pastor at a historic Atlanta church who has served less than two years in the Senate, presented himself as a committed public servant who has worked to cap the price of insulin, control gun violence and protect rights. That a patient's room is too narrow and small and cramped a space for a woman, her doctor and the United States government. The race has already been rocked by media reports that Walker, who has voiced opposition to abortion without exceptions, paid for an abortion in 2009 for a woman he was dating who later gave birth to one of his children. And on abortion, you know, I'm a Christian. Walker calls it a flat out lie. Many of the three dozen attendees came away fired up about Walker's chances, saying they were impressed by his performance. During the hour-long debate in Savannah, Walker accused Warnock of attacking the police, empowering criminals and allowing the powerful painkiller fentanyl into Georgia by not protecting U.S. borders. Walker was admonished by a debate moderator for using a prop that appeared to be a badge, after Warnock referred to dubious claims that Walker has worked in law enforcement and to a decades-old police report about Walker threatening to have a shootout with police. I've never threatened a shootout with the police. Well, and now I have to respond to that. We are, we are, we are no, moving no, 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 on, no. gentlemen. I have to respond to that. And you know what's so funny? I am work with many police officers. I ask you to put that prop away. The Republican has acknowledged struggling in the past with mental health and was asked if he still receives treatment. I talk to my pastors and I continue to get help if I need help, but I don't need any help. I'm doing well. Democrats hold slim majorities in the Senate and House of Representatives. Senate control could be decided by the outcome of races in Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, New Hampshire, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. A recent opinion poll conducted by the University of Georgia showed Warnock leading Walker 46 percent to 43 percent among likely voters. If neither candidate gets more than 50 percent of the vote on November 8th, the race would be decided in a December 6 runoff election. Each candidate pledged to accept the outcome of the election. The Mar-a-Lago search continues to face obstacles, the latest being the appointment of a special master to vet controversial documents. The Department of Justice is requesting the circumstance be dropped, claiming a breach in authority. The U.S. Justice Department on Friday asked an appeals court to shut down Special Master Raymond Deary's review of documents seized from Donald Trump's Florida home. In a filing to the Atlanta-based 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, prosecutors said Judge Aileen Cannon exceeded her authority when she named Deary as the special master to vet more than 11,000 seized documents. The DOJ said the move, which essentially blocked the department's access to the records, caused and continues to cause significant harm to the government and the public. The Federal Appeals Court had last month restored some of the department's access to some of the records. Now the department is appealing the rest of Judge Cannon's order. The former U.S. president is being probed for his handling of sensitive government records after leaving office in January 2021. Roughly 11,000 records were seized at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach in August. About two weeks after the search, Trump sued the Justice Department and asked for the special master review in a bid to keep some of the records away from investigators while the vetting took place. 
Elections are cause for more than political concern in Israel. Faith in a political solution has rarely deemed more distant among Palestinians amid escalating violence in the occupied West Bank ahead of the November 1st Israeli election. As an election looms over Israel, escalating violence in the occupied West Bank is front and center. These are not photos of politicians. Rather, they're the faces of the more than 100 Palestinians killed this year. Most since late March, during a crackdown by Israeli police, following a string of fatal street attacks by Palestinians in Israel, which killed 19 people. Ahead of the November 1 election, Prime Minister Yair Lapid has backed a two-state solution with an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel, which seized control of the West Bank in the 1967 Middle Eastern War. But with more and more Israeli settlements being built, Palestinians living in sprawling refugee camps are weary of political solutions. Top of mind for most Israeli voters is the soaring cost of living, according to surveys. Palestinian issues barely register as an election issue, though settlers in the West Bank are calling for a crackdown. Yossi Dagan, head of the Samaria Regional Council, called for action while at a protest after a car was fired on at a settlement near Nablus. We are in the midst of a wave of terror courtesy of the terrorist Palestinian Authority and all our government is doing instead of fighting the terrorism, confiscating weapons, reinstating roadblocks, is writing talkbacks like some pensioner. While Israeli officials blame the Palestinian Authority, the PA say their hands are tied by Israel. And despite the growing violence raising international alarm, there are no signs of a wider political solution in the conflict. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A huge fire blazed at a notorious prison where political prisoners and anti-government activists are kept in an Iranian capital. Online videos and local media reported gunshots as nationwide protests entered a fifth week. Twelve people were killed and three others injured after gunmen stormed the bar in Mexico's Erapito city. The gunmen are still at large and it's the second mass shooting in under a month in the state of Guanajuato. Thousands of people took to the streets of Paris to protest against soaring prices as weeks of strikes for higher wages at oil refineries spurred demands for a general strike. Elon Musk said his rocket company SpaceX would continue to fund its Starlink internet service in Ukraine, citing the need for good deeds a day after he said it could no longer afford to do so. Greek firefighters reported multiple deaths caused by the severe torrential flooding in the island of Crete. Victims were trapped in cars and some bodies were recovered at sea. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you've missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with Bollywood actresses walking the rap in traditional Indian dresses, presenting the latest collection of designers on the concluding day of Lakme Fashion Week. Thank you for watching and have a great night. <laughs>